computer last night, got everything ready, so that all the nurse has to do is lift it up and put it onto his lap with the site on there and you know his little Right now? Well, I'm I'm not on it. Press play. Press play. Is it a play? Yeah. I never had to do that. Sorry, folks. We are. Okay. Oh, uh, sorry. I want to repeat that announcement. But Dustin, you will not be seeing here at least for the foreseeable future. He's decided to go to Cornerstone. That's the Church of God Abraham and Faith in Madonna. So uh, that's all he wanted to say at the stage. So we'll continue with selections from Revelation. And next week, Carlos will be doing the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24, Mark 13 to 31. <laughs> for your interest next weekend. Uh, we'll be in Washington State. If you're in that area, do come. Robin Todd has organized a, a get-together, 50 people, which will be very exciting for all of us this next weekend, all of us taking part in that. Meanwhile, we're going to sing to open our service, Crown Him with Many Crowns. And Jerry has recorded the music for us, which is excellent. No, not recorded. Play it. Live. 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 Live in person. All right. Let's sing on. Live with all my words. Uh, Crown with many crowns. Matthew yeah, I think that's that will be. Yeah. Yeah. Y'all come now. Y'all come. As you can come. see, we're becoming a mega church. Yes. Yeah. Wrap it up there. We at least have four people who can sing parts. Right. Joe Lustig, watch out. We're up to you. We have 18,000. We have about We are small. But We're small. We have love. <laughs> 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 Israel, 
and through Jesus to us and to the whole world. Though the world has rejected that great truth about who you are, and sister, on a different view, we celebrate your one God, the one true God as Jesus described you, and we praise you for that unparalleled position that you have in the universe, having created everything, giving us every breath of air we're breathing right now. We bring to you this morning the needs of our congregation, those who are in trouble with sickness of various sorts, Tom Cox, we remember him now in hospital, in the hospital, ask you to sustain him through the difficulties that are always accompanying illnesses of all sorts. And others we've been praying for privately, we now extend our prayers to all of those who are, are in difficulty. We pray for them, those who are even committing, contemplating committing suicide because they don't believe that you exist. We remember that particular person ask you to comfort them, sustain them, intervene on their behalf. We ask you to be with us now with the operating presence and power of your Spirit and the Spirit of Jesus. We thank you, Messiah, for being our intercessor, for being at the right hand of the Father as the Adonai, the my Lord of Psalm 110. One, we pray that you, Father, and your Spirit and your Son will be operating here as we contemplate various topics in the book of Revelation. Give us a sense of understanding that we might then pass this information to others in view of the salvation that's offered through the words of Jesus and the gospel of the kingdom. We put all these things now in your hands and we praise you for the beautiful place, the peace, the comparative peace we have here in Georgia. We pray that your kingdom will come to solve the intractable problems of the world, but until then, we continue with the gospel and we thank you for our part in it. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. <coughs> so, if you want to interact with us by writing, that would be wonderful. I'm not guaranteed to get to all the points it's impossible to, to deal with everything, of course, but we were at least suggesting that we can interact on a limited basis, perhaps, uh, via the miracle of the internet. What we've been doing is looking at the book of Apocalypse, which is Apocalypse, which is the name in Greek of the book of Revelation. And if you read the critical scholars, you say they're not, sh they're not sure who even wrote the thing. Our position is the naive biblical position that Jesus sent it to us from God. That's what it says at the top. If you want to argue by who wrote it, good luck to you. I wouldn't bother. It came from God. That's what it says at the beginning. It was given to Jesus and given by an angel to John. End of story. Let's get on. You see, the world and its theology tries to waste a lot of time arguing about non-essential things. So you can argue about whether that John was John the Apostle. I think it was. Tradition says it was. That's good enough. You can waste your time and your energy discussing irrelevant things which avoid the main point is that we're supposed to understand this because in the first chapter... It says, this is a, an account of what is going to happen. It's a prophecy. I won't turn to all these, these texts. It would take too long. But at the end of the book, it says, if you dare take away from the words of the prophecy, you're in trouble. So there's a huge promise and a threat in the book of Revelation. I tremble before that. Uh, you can look it up sometime. We'll, we'll read it another week, but in the 22nd chapter, it says, if you take away from the prophecies of this book, or if you add to them, you're going to lose your place in the kingdom. That's an enormous threat. So, I tremble at the words of Jesus to us in the book of Revelation, and I warn you against the evil of false scholarship. We read about it in Jeremiah last week, the lying pen of the scribes. Jeremiah stood alone, complained against that situation. In some ways, not much has changed. Let me make this point to you too, that if you're studying the Old Testament, just to treat that as a history book is not enough. Let me give you an example, because this came to us this week. It's, it's a striking example. We'll get to, to our highlights of Revelation. In the 7th chapter of Isaiah, you all know that, Isaiah 7, 14, there's a prophecy about a virgin birth. You know that? A virgin, actually, the, the text says, the virgin will conceive and bear a child. And you all know that was fulfilled in Jesus, who was without human father, uniquely the second Adam. That's in Isaiah chapter 7. But there was apparently a local fulfillment of that back in the 8th century when Isaiah was writing. In the 8th century, Ahaz the king was a bad king. And there was some sort of miraculous event 
in terms of a young lady, exactly, we don't know the detail. Now, if you just read that as a history book, you say, well, that's nice for Ahaz in the 8th century, isn't that great? God did something there by way of a young lady. You missed the whole point. In other words, when you're reading the Old Testament, you want to read it through the eyes of Jesus and the New Testament. See that? So it's a great mistake just to treat these books as history books. Yes, it's interesting, it's history. But you, you haven't begun to expound it until you expound it through the lens of Jesus who has come, the Messiah who has come, and all the things that are predicted to the future. So, the book of Revelation then is a summation of a prophecy of future things. And the scholars, some of them say, oh no, it was all fulfilled in 70 AD. See, if you don't like the future, you put it in the past. It's very dangerous. You get rid of the future, but it's all over. I call that the preterizing, the pastizing of prophecy. Well, you get rid of it. So I'm not going to see that. I'm going to believe the stuff about the future. So, I want to start with this text uh, in 2 Thessalonians 2, in preparation for the highlights of Revelation. This is the justification, I believe, for what we're doing. And Paul is a good man to rely on in many, many ways. He's an inspired writer, of course, wrote a mass of New Testament stuff. But look at our intrepid Paul in 2 Thessalonians 2, and you'll all learn that 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is the Antichrist chapter. You should all know that. 12, chapter, 12 verses there of intensely interesting material about what is still lying in the future in terms of the final Antichrist. But look what Paul said in 2 Thessalonians 2, having discussed the order of events, which is highly relevant to us today. You're supposed to understand how the order of events works. Namely, that the Antichrist comes before the coming of Christ in that order, not, as Hal Lindsay says wrongly, the other way around. So Paul is destroying the notion, really, that Christ can come back today. But look what Paul says in verse 5 here. 2 Thessalonians 2, 5. Don't you remember that while I was still with you, I used to be telling you these things. Isn't that neat? What? 2,000 years ago, Paul was lecturing, preaching on the order of events that had come to the second coming. Isn't that amazing? Really? Here we are 2,000 years later, hopefully reproducing Paul. I'm looking at <coughs> a young man in front of me, Matthew, from our, one of our families, and I'm thinking, as he's sharing this, down the line, he's going to be married and have his children. Hopefully, well, we don't know Christ might come back, you know, before that, some year, I don't know that. But we are to reproduce these things, apparently, generation after generation. It's amazing. I don't think Paul imagined 2,000 years beyond this. They didn't know. But here we are, and Paul then, when he founded the church in Thessalonica, probably it took him three weeks. Paul would come to a town, there'd be a lot of Jews there who'd come be in what Paul was saying, and they would bring some of their Gentile friends, and Paul would lecture on these topics 2,000 years ago. Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to be, the, the language people love that, I used to be, not I just told you once, I used to lecture on this topic when I was with you for three weeks. People say, oh, prophecy, give me Christian living. <laughs> what? You have to live by every word of God, not just the bits you like. People say, oh, I just want to know how to have a better marriage. That's fine too. I want to, you know, better this or that, a better way to live. All of that's excellent. But we don't pick and choose. So this passage in 2 Thessalonians is validation for what we're doing. We're trying to reproduce Paul's and Jesus' uh, teaching on the future. And next week, Carlos, when we're away, is going to be talking about the Olivet Discourse. A whole long sermon from Jesus. Reproduced three times. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Is it important? You bet. Have people mangled it and reduce it to nothing yet? It's mass chaos. So these things are important. Why? Because you're supposed to have the mind of Christ. And the mind of Christ comes from the words of Christ. You can't accept Jesus and not accept his words. I'm getting slightly attacked here. Think of this. If you are voting for a political candidate, would you say, I'm voting for him, I haven't got a clue what he stands for. I don't know about his platform. I don't know what he says, but I'm voting for him. That's silly. People are accepting Jesus without knowing who Jesus is or what he taught. That's very dangerous. So the Bible really only says one thing. You better listen to Jesus, you better listen to Jesus, you better obey Jesus and Paul. Jesus in Paul and Jesus in Jesus, right? The words, the words, the words. Because many will say in that day, Lord, Lord, look at all the stuff we did for church. Only to be told they weren't off the first place. So that's a continual warning. With that in mind, then, let's see what Jesus tells us in the book of Revelation. You bear in mind that the book of Revelation is a composite mosaic 
set of verses alluding to about 450 passages in the Old Testament. You got it? So Jesus here has gotten the substance of all the prophets and he's put them all together and given us a composite picture. That's fantastically interesting to me. So when we're studying the book of Jeremiah, when we hear echoes of Jesus, we want to expound that. For instance, Jeremiah is constantly talking about a time of great trouble coming. Even in the book of Jeremiah, the great, the great time of trouble, Jacob's trouble. We're reading it through that lens now, because Jesus talked about that great time of trouble. Anyway, my simple point is this. This is a massively important subject. These are not things, you know, that we do where we can't think of anything else to do. They're very central. So if you don't know your Old Testament well, you're going to miss out some of Revelation. But it's 450 allusions or citations from all of the prophets. I don't think anybody claims to understand every word of Revelation. There's some areas where you, you, know, you, could, you could debate it. But the substance of what is said is interesting. So, in the book of Revelation, what we've done so far, before we pick up a few more major points, we started with the first chapter, which is introduction. God sends a message to Jesus, and Jesus, through an angel, sends it to John, right? And it's a prophecy. We noted that in verse 8, the Almighty there is God. God is, never, is always the Almighty. Jesus is never called the Almighty, not once, to him. That's the Hebrew El Shaddai, the Greek Pantokrator, the all-powerful one, is always a reference to God, never to Jesus. But some red letter Bibles try to mislead you. They try to make Jesus the spokesman in 1 8. That's just wrong. We're up against a huge battle to redefine God as one, and Jesus as the human Messiah. The great uh, exponents of Christology, as the study of who Jesus is, are waging a, currently a huge battle. I mean, the public doesn't know this, but there's a vast printing battle going on. It's just quite amazing. And they're trying to justify the idea that Jesus is God, is the Almighty. That's very dangerous. You don't usurp the position of God. You should be trembling in your boots. If you're entering a building where it believes in a different God than what Jesus believed in, that's dangerous. We've got a couple of books coming out this week. Ehrman and good, good point. the evangelicals arguing for that's right. so the same thing. Really. That's right. Yeah, I mean, this is another subject, but this very week, Mark Ehrman, who is really an unbeliever now, and confessedly so, is going to describe who he thinks Jesus is. It'll probably be some good historical information for us, too. We'll see. But otherwise, Bishop Tom Wright, who, who graciously corresponded with me a few weeks back and got the letters, they are defending the idea that Jesus is God. The problem is that makes two gods. You thought of it? And they're defending it in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, where it says, We believe in one God the Father, for them, and one Lord Jesus Messiah. There you go. There's one God the Father and one Lord God Jesus Messiah. Uh-uh. That makes two. The universe is about to crumble. These are not small issues. God punished these people in Israel when they got the God thing wrong. Don't want to get the God thing wrong. That's just wonderfully easy. So anyway, that's another battle that's going on, but it is a battle. I want to press on you. We're not talking academics here. We're not coming to church to, to, to split hairs on words. We're talking about the most fundamental issues of all, the commandments that Jesus said are the, the most important. You mustn't get wrong. And some of us mugginses did get this wrong. We used to believe that God was... There were two gods in the God family. I mean, how bad is that? I look back on that, I should weep. Two gods, I don't think so. Two gods in, oh, two gods in the God, oh my goodness. Now I think there's three, so. I was thinking there's virtually three. Now it's another subject. Back to Revelation, the first chapter is introduction. Now, chapters two and three are letters to churches. Jesus reviews the troops. He looks at the churches currently at that time, who are typical of churches at any time. They have the same good things and bad things, presumably. And in those seven letters to the churches, he finds only two of them to be without criticism, really. It's interesting. So there are five of those seven who have serious problems. So we try to apply this to ourselves. Where are we here? Are we the lukewarm that God is going to spit out of Jesus is going to spit out of his mouth? I don't think so. I hope not. We don't want to be that category. So chapter four, then, if you're memorizing the whole book, 22 chapters, you should be ready to teach this to your friends around the coffee table if the opportunity comes. We've got chapter 4 is a, an incredible vision of God, the Father. If you want you know, to feel close to God, read that and, and see what kind of amazing scene is enacted there in here in chapter 4. And guess what? Chapter 5 is a similar thing, but this time it's Jesus. And I'm not saying Jesus is just a mere man, whatever that means. It doesn't mean anything. 
But he is a man. He's a highly exalted man. So you have this amazing scene in chapter 5 of Jesus being celebrated as the Messiah. So he's not a mere man. That's a fog word, by the way. Watch out for fog words. It doesn't mean anything. What's a mere man? I'm not sure. He is a man, however, but he's a highly exalted man at the right hand of the Father. That's okay. If God wants to exalt a man to the right hand of his own throne, let him do it. Oh, the devil says, no, no, no. Man couldn't be that good. He's got to be God. He couldn't sit at the right hand of God. He must be God. Well, wait a minute. That's two gods. You just broke the first commandment. Don't do that. No, there's an exalted man, second Adam, at the right hand. For some reason, it's the yeah. first commandment. <laughs> For some good reason, it's the first commandment. The Jew, he's referring to Mark 12, 29. You should all have Mark 12, 29. You know, ready to go. Any situation in the checkout line, wherever you go. Mark 12, 29. Have you ever thought about this, you say to your friend? Jesus said, the greatest commandment of all, the one that you mustn't get wrong, is listen, Israel. Listen, Israel. Don't miss it. The Lord our God is one Lord. How many lords is that? One. Oh, were you telling me that Jesus is Lord God? Yes. I thought you thought the Father was Lord God. Ah, there's two. People are not thinking about this. We have to get this conversation going. They're thinking about every other conversation, right? They're arguing about politics endlessly. <laughs> People love that. But are they thinking about the words of Jesus? Well, I was, I was thinking about yeah. the Ten Commandments, too, that, they yeah. lost, that, that the government loves to put yes. in their institutions. <laughs> and the first commandment in yes. there is exactly what has exactly. been broken. Right? Idolatry is the biggest possible sin we have to avoid. Putting something in the place of God, whether it be another God or another part of our lives, that's not a good idea. So, Jesus began then with that. Here, O Israel, Mark 12, 29, agreeing with a Jew, could you imagine, agreeing with a Jew on the most important commandment. Ask any Jew, talk to a rabbi, they'll tell you. Their people died for that. They had, to, they had their nails pulled out of their hands. They was, their skin was combed. You know, they were tortured to death. And they would not give up the belief that God is one. Okay, so you can meditate on the Shema, the hero of Israel. Think about that deeply. Talk to everybody about it. We'll get the conversation going. Chapter 5, then, is a marvelous celebration of Messiah. You can worship the Messiah. People think if you worship somebody, that means they are God. That's false. David was worshipped in the Old Testament. And Abigail, that wonderful lady in 1 Samuel 25, got off her donkey with her maidens and worshipped David, said, I see that God is using you, David, to fight his battle. And she worshipped him. She married him too, by the way. Interesting. A fascinating story. First Samuel 25, and marvelous material. So worship is elastic. You can worship the mayor in England. We used to talk about the, not in the sense that we use worship now, but we used to talk about his worship, the mayor. The Lord Mayor of London, his worship, the mayor. We didn't mean he was God. You got it? So tell your friends that the word Lord in the New Testament can be applied to God and the gardener. You won't see that in your translation, but Kyrios, Lord, is the Lord God, is the Lord Jesus, Kyrios. and the gardener that Mary Magdalene encountered, she says, Sir, Kyrios, Lord. Got it? All this needs to be clarified because it's a big model. Then in chapter 6, surveying the book as you're memorizing substance of it here, in chapter 6, we get into some seals, do we not? There are seven seals. I'm not going to go through them all. There are seven seals because Jesus is allowed to open this sealed document, sealed with seven seals. And apparently then that reflects, and maybe Carl will comment on this next week, many of the events in Matthew 24. War, famine, death. It's not a pretty picture. Martyrs, then the sixth seal, terror, and the seventh seal, is coming after that. However, that's not quite the end, because when you get to the seventh seal, it opens up into, guess what, seven trumpets. I see. And that's not the end either, because when you get to the seventh trumpet, you'll find in the book, we get to seven what? Plagues. They're not the happiest part to read. The plagues are in chapter 15 and 16. You're memorizing. 15 and 16, the plagues are open up. Presumably, the seals, the seventh seal becomes seven trumpets, seven trumpets becomes seven trumpets. That seems to be the fact. After that, then you have the description of the second coming. Jesus has a sickle and he reaps the world. That sounds awfully like the parable of the soul, the reaping of the good and then the destruction of the wicked. In chapter 20, you will tell your friends, we have the millennium, the thousand-year reign of the saints, which is a very central part of the Bible. 
because it tells you how you're going to function in that kingdom. And we discovered that some were not clear on that. They thought that vaguely, when the kingdom comes, they will sit under a fig tree and stare at the sky for a thousand years. That's not right. You are being groomed and trained to function as administrators with Jesus. That's the whole point of Christian training. That comes to be in chapter 20, where those who had had their heads chopped off came to life. That's a real resurrection. And not only this, others, not only just martyrs. John wasn't martyred, I think, so he'd still be there. All the faithful of all the ages, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the prophets, and all the faithful, whoever they are exactly, come to life, or if they're alive, they get caught up to meet the Lord together with the dead who are being raised. And they function as administrators uh, with Christ for a thousand years. Now that puts the pressure on us today. Does God want you in his future government? If you're a drunk, uh, uh, you know, an adulterer, a fornicator, I don't think so. If you're not trustworthy, you know, all these things. So that's the Christian living part of this whole gospel of the kingdom. Okay, that's enough, I think, of the survey. You've got the general idea, introduction, letters to the churches. You've got seals and trumpets and plagues. Then you've got various interludes that are interspersed there. You've got a discussion of the woman whose ideal Israel bearing the son who is the Messiah and the Messiah is caught up to be with God in, in chapter 12. And then you've got the greatest key of all, which is a period of 1260 months. 1260 days, sorry, days. And if you know your Bible, you know where that comes from, Daniel chapter 9. So we have to allude to that. There's nothing more important than that. Daniel is the basis for a lot of this. Jesus loved the book of Daniel. He saw his own career there as the Son of Man. So he meditated long and hard on the book of Daniel. And in that book of Revelation that we're doing now, you find about five or six references to 1260 days, i.e. three and a half years, i.e. 42 months. Taking a year, 360 days, as they did. That's really where the concentration of the book of Revelation is. It's an unpacking of that final time just before the second coming. It's must be very important, God, right? For those of us who are perhaps living in that day, I don't know that we are. It could be 500 years before Christ comes. I don't know that. Our sense has always been it's going to be very soon. I don't know. We have no chronology that I know of to tell you when. But when we do get that time, be it Matthew's great-grandchildren. You know, Matthew's is in his teens. Maybe he's great. I don't know that. Could be my lifetime. It's a much shorter span. Don't know that. But what I do know is that Paul used to preach on this even in the three weeks he founded the church. People say, oh, I don't do prophecy, I just do Christian Wait a minute, that's a cop out. It means you're too lazy to study. Get busy and study. Live by every word. Okay, so that is very key then, this chronological period, 1260 days, three and a half years, 42 months, we'll come across that. And it comes from Daniel 9. So if you go back a moment and look at chapter 9 of Daniel, known in textbooks as the dismal swamp of biblical prophecy studies. In other words, mass chaos. I'm not surprised, because the devil loves to mess with the most important things, and it's somewhat chaotic. It shouldn't be that difficult. Jesus obviously referred to this last half of the 70 weeks. Again, we're not doing academics here. We're not quibbling over words. We're talking about the things that Jesus loved, and that are part of Revelation throughout the Bible. So, in Daniel, let me ask somebody to read chapter... 9 of Daniel, we won't, we won't read the whole book, we did that, that whole chapter, I mean, we did that at some point not too long ago. But let me just summarize the whole of chapter 9 by telling you that Daniel was watching, the had watched the destruction of his own city, right? He saw his own beloved city, Jerusalem, in ruin, because in 585 or so, those wicked foreigners had really created havoc. And so Dan is looking at the city and the temple, of course, and he's saying, oh God, how long before this is put right? Because these people loved Jerusalem. They loved that. They loved the city. They knew that God's temple had to ultimately dwell there. God would be there present. Jesus would be there. And the Messiah came. So they're terribly distressed in chapter 9. If you want to learn how to pray, read the ninth chapter of Daniel. He pours out his heart and an angel shows up and gives him a prophecy. 
we will not go through all of this, but in verse 24, chapter 9, 70 weeks, 70 heptads, period of sevens, not weeks strictly, the NIV has this right, 70 sevens, could be minutes, could be seconds, could be thousands of years, no, 70 periods of seven, periods of time, sevens, shall we miss heptads, it turns out to be years, otherwise it would make no sense at all. 70 times 7 years, how many is that? 490 years. And this is where we have a prediction of the first coming of Jesus. Verse 25, you also know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, I'm not going to deal with that part, it's in history, perhaps 444, that area, there was a, an issue given by Persian authorities, to rebuild Jerusalem. From that point on, you have 483 years dealt with, leaving seven years left over. So Mary and the community must have known, I think, and maybe the people who came from the East, those wise men, they had some idea of this prophecy. They were expecting the Messiah to arrive, but they knew exactly. I'm not sure that. Do you think they got around yeah. together and has, you know, oh, when sure. they were around the dinner table <laughs> totally. and, and discussed, hey Absolutely. folks, we, we've done the time, we're, we're in the time. Absolutely. You know, I'm they, sure they did. I mean, they must have discussed these things. Oh, yes. Yeah. And then when Mary has an angel come to the kitchen and say, you're the one, can you imagine that? And, we, and yeah, I mean, she course. knew the prophecies. She, she wasn't, did. like, I mean, she was astounded maybe it was her, but... Right. They did. She did. Yes. This wasn't like that. And all these other famous people like Anna and Zechariah and all these people, they are the community of faith that we belong to. Boy, were they excited. Of course they were. They were thrilled. And Mary then was the most excited of all. So how in the world is this going to work? I'm not even mad. What are you talking about, Gabriel? When an angel shows up and speaks yeah. to you, you're supposed to believe it, by the way. Do you know that? What happened to Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, when he didn't believe what the angel said? He was yeah. struck down for nine months? Watch out. You choose not to believe what the Bible says. Shh. Watch out. You're in trouble. When an angel speaks, we'd better listen. So, Zechariah learned that lesson. He was a priest himself. Mary, probably 16 years old, 15 years old. How in the world is this going to be? You're talking about me getting pregnant. Don't be ridiculous. I don't have a husband. <coughs> no problem. Luke 135. Gabriel said in about 26 words, very easy, no argument, very straightforward. The Holy Spirit will come over you, Mary. Will overshadow you. And for that reason precisely, the baby being begotten is the Son of God. End of argument. Isn't that one? The church has since made a havoc of that little promise. They said, no, 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 we don't want that sort of a Jesus beginning in time. We'll say the Son was eternally begotten, never had a beginning. It's mass chaos. It needs to be reformed. That's why Dan Gill calls it like 21st century reformation. We need to reform this and get it easier so people can understand Okay, so that prophecy, as Michelle is pointing out, was certainly being discussed by the community of faith at that time. The angel comes and says they're going to be 490 years, I see. 26 says, after the 62 and the 7 that goes with it, that's 69 of the periods of 7, the Messiah is going to be cut off. First he comes, it says it will be so many years until Messiah comes, that's what they must have been really calculating. And then he's going to be cut off. Well, that surely speaks to you of the crucifixion, doesn't it? He was cut off after that 69 years. And he will not have anything. Presumably that means he didn't get his kingdom, which you know is exactly right. He didn't come into his kingdom immediately. And then this fascinating statement, in verse 26 of Daniel 9, the people of the prince who is coming will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Wow! Now that's a bad guy, I want to tell you. The people of the prince, his people, and the guy himself, who is coming, will destroy, that's a bad thing, the city and the sanctuary. And I must suggest you this has never been fulfilled yet. And one of the keys here, we've done a lot on this, many, many people agree with this, it's not something we've grown up. It says the city and the sanctuary will be destroyed by the people of the prince who is coming, and his end will be with the flood. His end, not its end. Not the end thereof, but his end. Why is that so important? Whoever this guy is, he comes to his end in, this destru- in, in the judgment that follows what he the evil is. Yeah. didn't happen in 70 AD. Titus did not come to his end. Titus, the Roman general, 
if for 18 years long, beyond that time, and didn't come to his end in that disaster, it will not work for 87. It's a prophecy of the end time destruction of the uh, Antichrist. That's a very interesting point to me. Yeah. Um, I just <coughs> have a question where it says the people of the Prince. Yes. Together, along so with them. That's oh. those who've been caught up with him. No, these are these are wicked people. The people of the evil prince who comes to destroy them. Oh yes. Mm-hmm. We can get this right in our strong tool. Right. The, so the prince who comes to the battle. His armies, I guess. His armies. He and his armies, and then his end specifically, you could say the people's end as well, either one. Either the people's end or the prince's end. Doesn't matter. The whole lot of evil people. We so can get this right in the Armstrong. Jerusalem. 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 Yes, absolutely. City sanctuary, Jerusalem. Absolutely. Remember, that's what Daniel's praying about, right? The whole topic of the prayer is answered by this Gabriel message. He's been begging God, "When are the ruins of the city going to be established?" You know, I'm looking for that. That's, that's what he's praying about. That's the whole answer to prayer. See the logic of the prayer. As you read the whole of the ninth, of cha- ninth chapter, the whole deal is, oh God, the city's in ruins. The enemies have destroyed it. When's it going to be restored? Ultimately and finally. And so the answer to the prayer is exactly this. After 70 years, finally, 70 times 7 years, 490 years, it's all going to be put right. The answer is not, it's all going to be put wrong. If the answer to the prayer is 70 AD, when the city was ruined again, you would think, that's interesting. It's just nonsense. He's praying, when is everything going to be good, not that it's going to be bad. So, 70 AD will not work. This is the fulfillment of this. Because in 70 AD, what happened to Jerusalem? It was butchered. And it's one of the well established facts of history. <coughs> Romans destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD. There is therefore a future uh, happening of, of great magnitude. And there are so many prophecies, we haven't time to read them all. We've talked of that great tribulation where Iran, Iraq, Russia, whatever it is, and the, you know the scene in the Middle East is pretty awful right now. I saw on CNN last night or Fox News. I saw a lady has written a book called The Israel Solution. Our point is there is no solution. Israel had better just dig in and say this is our, you know this part of the land belongs to us because the Arabs will not accept that. They will not accept it. They want Israel to be wiped off the face of it. There's no solution, barring a complete change of heart. So Israel better stand for them. I thought, you know, your grandfather, my father would have been deeply interested in that. Anyway, so that's coming, but it's going to be a good time coming. The prayer is, oh God, when 